Hi guys, welcome back to the next episode of Don't Fear the Weight in the Lockdown. Um, I think I should be actually starting the episodes with that um, because we've done like six episodes of this whilst we've been in lockdown. But then again, I think it's just reminding us that we are in lockdown. But I hope all of you are safe. Um, thank you once again for tuning in. Today in the hot seat, I have a very good friend of mine um, who I've known for quite a long time, although he seems to have lost a lot of hair. Is this just down to the, the lockdown haircut thing that everybody's doing? I've done this myself. Yes, I can, I can tell. <laughs> Guys, welcome Chris Peel from the Move Well Project back onto the podcast. Um, we've had a podcast a few times previously um, all about moving well, funnily enough. Um, so Chris, just in case people have missed um, the first podcast that we did, do you want to just give us a little bit of your background, who you are and um, why we're friends? Okay, so yeah, um, I'm from a personal training background originally um, and... I kind of fell into doing a lot of rehab stuff and now I'm kind of trying my best to keep moving forward myself and blend uh, seamlessly from working with people who are injured right through to people for improved performance because I don't think they should be separate things. I think one of the things we do quite badly as, a, as an industry, be it either fitness side or therapy side, is view them as separate things and view people as either the sort of traditional mentality of they are injured, they are on the injured list if it was professional sport, or they are fit and well and they are healthy. And actually it's much more of a sort of spectrum and we've all got our own sort of issues all the time. And whether you're doing sort of rehabilitation stuff with people or you're doing performance work with people, it's all just movement, just at different intensities. Mm. So yeah, pretty much what I'm doing at the moment is trying to offer the most sort of holistic service I can in terms of helping people with how they're moving in order to either be in less pain or not injure themselves or not be injured or to improve performance. That's the idea. Cool. And you work with some big guys in the industry as well. I'm not talking about big names. I'm just talking about physical stature as in big guys. Yeah. So uh, again, that kind of happened organically by accident, but I yeah. think the, the big thing about that, is if you're working in sort of rehab or therapy, and you're from a bit of a training background and your mentality is to keep training, that kind of attracts that because the vast majority of therapists, um, and, and to be fair, this isn't even particularly well backed in the evidence, um, will say, oh, yeah, don't do that or stop doing that or do that with less load or whatever else. And I think that the, the problem with that is now, if you look at stuff from like, or oh, Tim Gabbard's stuff about um, acute chronic workload ratios and things, that's massive in pro sport, all the time that you're deloading something, you're becoming deconditioned. So mm. you're then, strictly speaking, putting yourself at more risk as you try and get back to the level you were at. So the whole sort of name of the game being how how well conditioned in general can you stay rest of body whilst dealing with whatever specific issue you've got. Yeah, and it, and it is a, a different mentality, and then um, it, it, it's scary how certainly the therapy industry doesn't really get on board with that because actually like passive therapy is good business because they need you they need you to rub them they need you to attach whatever electrodes or needles or whatever else and, you know occasionally there will be a, a, a place for that but realistically none of that's really making a big difference and um, mm. if you're a performance athlete it's not it's not changing tissues it's not getting any kind of metabolic change or any change in um, the way that you're moving in terms of like neural patterning and, and, and learning new movements you're not doing any of that out of an office with a bed in it yeah. doing that in the gym or on a training field so that that's what the aim should be it should be about you know, what's your goals um okay so how do we get you from where you are now to those goals that's the personal training mentality mm. and that to me was actually a phenomenal background for them working with people who are injured because that's the integration you're going okay so where are you now and where do you want to be whereas actually the mentality if you've got a more traditional sort of physiotherapist background you've come straight out of a level straight to university and you've been to a degree you've had your thinking conditioned through that process where your thinking is how do we get you so you're not displaying an actual pathology and then that's it job done i'm finished so you're not your, your mentality isn't integrating what you're doing towards their goal your mentality is to treat them till there is no diagnosable pathology mm. and then that's it because they're out of your office they're not on your waiting list you you know think about the sort of NHS mentality you're not affecting our statistics anymore you're away yeah. it's very very different so yeah I think the, the fitness 
that kind of fitness mentality lends itself towards working with people who have got a goal. And also, we've talked about this, um, yeah. getting your head around the idea that what you're doing as a specialist has very little to do with either health or fitness. It's a performance goal for its own outcome, which might be fantastic for your mental health, and it might be fantastic for your um, self-esteem and your, your own self-identity and perception and whatever else. It's not really very good for you to be pushing the boundaries. So like, um, you know, I gave myself a hernia trying to set a British record no one cares about. Literally nobody cares about, even yeah. within the own weird thing that no one cares. It's not the all ego, that's for me. Yeah. So the argument that if you were going to do like kettlebell snatch, which is what I was doing when I did it, for health reasons, you could say, well, actually it's got loads of health benefits. You know, you um, produce an explosive force, more importantly, when you're dropping it, you're having to sort of absorb that load um, dynamically, which has a, a massive effect in terms of reducing injury risk because that kind of eccentric load and that catching effect is the sort of thing that conditions you against sort of falling and uh, unexpected loads, like if you have an impact. So it's, it's got loads of benefit for that. But like anything else, it's like a bell curve or a U-curve. Like up to doing it with about 20 kilos at my body weight, it's probably very healthy and very good for you. Yeah. When you try and do it with 40 kilos, it in itself becomes a greater risk than the benefit it's giving you outside of the gym. So it, it, it goes full circle and becomes a problem. So the big guys that I'll be working with are doing things that are intrinsically bad for them. Mm. And I think there's certainly a place in the industry for still working with them being entirely honest with them that, that that is the case without that coming with any kind of judgment or um, the whole condescending thing of, well, why, why would you do that? I understand yeah. entirely why they would do that. You know, I, um, I appreciate them doing that. And I think that we've got a bit of a weird thing, haven't we? Like everyone wants to celebrate um, Usain Bolt, everyone wants to celebrate um, Paul Radcliffe and you know people setting and breaking these records. Um, who was it who decided that that's more valid than, you know, Ed being the first person to pick up 500 kilos? Sure, exactly. Okay, if they want to do it um, for what is essentially its own goal and is probably not great for your health, well, marathon running is probably not great for your health either, but it's much more socially acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. Do you find, um, talking about obviously big guys, um, do you find that they are harder to work with when they are in their quote unquote off season? So at the times when they're actually actively gaining a lot more weight, do you find that they have more niggles when they're in their off season because they're obviously pushing their weight and lifting more weight without a lot of the conditioning elements? Um, I don't know if many of the spread strength sports have that formal and off season really for a lot of mm. um, I think things change as people get a lot bigger quickly. Yeah, yeah. Or a lot smaller quickly. Um, mm. Certainly with a lot of the, the bodybuilders, if you come off um, quite a long period of dieting and you stack weight on quite quickly, that sent that that leads to issues. So I, I can think of a few people who've um, essentially ended up with a distended gut quite quickly post mm. comp, and that affects um, that affects how you move quite dramatically. Because of course, you've got firstly you're having to kind of move around the distension. It's not dissimilar to um, women getting back pain in pregnancy. It's, sure. it's, the, it's the same position, it's the same issues that it causes, and we all completely recognise and go, yeah, yeah, you like to get back pain during pregnancy. Mm. So, well, yeah, you like to get it. Um, you like to get it post comp if you if you if you blew up. Absolutely. And this is your area, not mine. But the the digestion issues with eating things that you haven't eaten in a long time. And oh, that, horrendous. Yeah, well, that coupled with a hell of a lot of inflammation, water gain. Um, I have a very good friend who did the same thing. He needed to gain quite a lot of weight very, very quickly. Um, this was an assisted uh, athlete as well, or an assisted bodybuilder. And obviously, once you come off all of the diuretics that he was using in order to get completely dry, and then had 
all of the food and not less, not as much movement, not as much conditioning or cardio and that kind of thing. Started getting very, very tight in his hips and his knees, his shoulders, lower back. Absolutely everything was happening because it was too quick. So even though physiologically it was needed to, for him to obviously gain that weight, actually it came with a lot of downsides. Yeah, so was, that links in with the, um, a lot of the ideas that, um, this were the best thing that came for me from doing the master stuff is the mentality that in a sense you can do a lot of stuff mechanically to um or sort of biomechanically to kind of deload some tissues and take some stress off and, and have fewer problems but actually any changes that happen too quickly carry their own risk because if you depend how you interpret all that stuff the acute chronic workload ratio stuff mm. if you just think what's happening at a more sort of localized level if you gain that weight that fast and that also sort of changes the way you're moving somewhat because you're now having to move around your distended gut and down to the the digestion issues and bloating, you've actually reduced, if you like, again, you've got to be careful because people get all upset about this, this sort of terminology, but you've reduced core stability. Yeah. We all know, like, if you think of Christmas Day after you've had your Christmas dinner and actually you've been eating and drinking since the minute you opened your eyes, you can't be gently braced and stable because you, you're bloated. So if you've got that effect going on, yeah, you're going to have to find that stability elsewhere. And you're going to find it because of the, the position it puts you in. Effectively, you're going to create a lever in your lower back that's not there the rest of the time. So you, yeah. it, you just created a new, a new lever relative to gravity. You've got to support. So that's been supported muscularly. And that muscle's now got to do a load of work it wasn't doing before. Mm. So if you look at the concept and go, right, acute to current workload rate ratio, to put numbers on it, anything over like 10% increase in workload in less than a week. In the football studies using like GPS workload, just quite a nominal figure, that was the, you know, the, the originally purported magic number. And I think I think even Tim Gavis talked about this and said we need to get not too hung up on this exact number and whatever else and be a bit more understanding of the concept. For that person who's post comp bodybuilding, they've just gone from the lower back not really doing any work when they're just standing around because there's no lever there, so it doesn't have to do anything. Mm. So even if you've got a small lever, it's got to do a shitload more work just overnight. So percentage wise, yeah, that's gonna cause you a problem, it's gonna overload that tissue, you're gonna get pain. And it's not um it's not a dead simple straightforward thing that is it because there's it's this multifaceted aspect they're gonna have to get nutrition under control and to some degree sometimes they might just have to be a little bit patient with adapting to a rapid change mm. the tissue aren't going to adapt as quickly as they've made the change in gaining gaining weight and, and effectively changing body shape indeed and that's really interesting because let's face it we have had a massive rapid change over the last kind of six weeks by being thrown into lockdown and not managing to actually get into the gym so what have we ended up doing we need to try and adapt our training and we've seen lots and lots of different people just kind of go right okay what can i do i've got a bar and i've got some weights i want to lift heavy squats but i can't actually clean and press the amount that i want on my back in order to do it so i'm going to put it on wheelie bins and don't get me wrong I've used it before, but I'm a short ass. So actually for me, <laughs> the wheelie bin height was pretty decent, but you're not an advocate of using wheelie bins. So let's get into some of the issues that you've seen on Instagram of what people are starting to use and adapt to based on this rapid change. And, and have, have people come to you and said, oh my God, Chris, I've done myself a mischief doing wheelie bin squats. <laughs> One of the thing with this is more... Um... I'm not bothered if people use really bins or not. I just think it's being fairly sort of narrow-minded. And, and I, I have this, like, I, I had this with my, with my wife and um, some some people are like, you know, very close to you, very close friends, where I'm laughing because I'm like, yeah, obviously I'm a complete hippie, but, like, really, you, you're that close-minded that if you can't put the bar on your back, you cannot train, you cannot train legs. You cannot, it's like, it's like a religious type belief, isn't it? That I must have that bar on my back. And it's like, well, not necessarily. And to me, I think it opens up a, another question mark that the only lifters would tell you that you should be able to front squat 
your maximum clean weight of three or vice versa, whichever way that ratio works. So effectively, mm. if you could lift it out of the rack, you could do three with it. You should be able to clean that amount. So you should be able to then pull that to a height you can jump underneath and then still have enough energy to stand up. Stop so that. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Stop they that. Are, okay, they are a specialist. Yes, yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying you should be able to. But realistically, you should be able to power clean something that you can then do a worthwhile amount of jump squats with. Yeah. So if you, if you take your power clean ratio off your deadlift, you're looking at something like if you can't hit 50% of your deadlift for a power clean, mm. that's not great really. That's a bit of an issue. Okay. In itself. So 50% of your deadlift, you shouldn't be able to do that many front squats anyway. No. So realistically, all it shows you is if you can't clean enough weight to do a meaningful set of front squats, you've got other problems. And these other problems are likely to cause you other issues, either, you know, either now, but they might be already, or somewhere down the line. So think like from like a hippie perspective, the way I think about it, all it's doing is identifying that you're massively, massively imbalanced. Mm. Now, to some degree, if you're a bodybuilder and that's your goal, then you're trying to be imbalanced. You're trying to be a freak. You're trying to be, you're trying to look freaky. So the whole point is you, you're going to have to get imbalanced to some degree. Yeah. Because you, you need to be so muscle-bound that that is your, your outline. That, that's fine. That makes some sense. But even so, you should be training in a, at least some of the time, you know, in a sort of moderate to high rep range. So surely, yeah, if you can't clean a weight that is challenging by rep 15, what is wrong with you? Why can't you do that? Yeah. And that should be other things that you also now have the opportunity to work on whilst you're in, uh, whilst you're in lockdown. Um, it should be something to think about. Yeah, you know, like our older actors, why not? And and you know, people who give it. I'm too big. I'm like, well, I'm not sure I buy that because. If you go back to like the was it the seventies they dropped the strict press out of um, Olympic lifting? Oh, the, might have been the guy who had the American record for the strict press was a guy called Ken Patera who then wrestled in WWF afterwards, and he amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, this is like eighties stuff, so I think it was the seventies. But he was like one hundred and thirty-five kilos body weight. Yeah, he yeah. And he had a, he, he, he could hold it in, in rack. And you go, oh, yeah, well, he's not a lifter. And it's like, yeah, but it's, that, that's when all he lifted included a strict press. So he was also massive in the upper body. And he could still do that. So you can't be sure sheer size is actually an argument for that. Same as like, you know, you'll be able to think of bodybuilders who can do the splits and could do the splits. Yeah. It's not mutually exclusive. Like Ernie Taylor was incredibly flexible and moved incredibly well. Uh, Melvin mm -hmm. Anthony was. Um, I'm not really up with modern day because you're probably correct <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was like ah, all right mate that's like so 10 years ago <laughs> but yeah okay <laughs> more, but, yeah, yeah when, I, when i was much more interested in bodybuilding those guys were able to do that and they, they were massive so you know i don't i don't buy that it's not possible but that brings you to another question then so i'm saying well this is now highlighting the problem if you can't front, uh, if you can't clean a weight that gives you a relevant challenge for front squats you, you've got an imbalance you've got a problem I suppose where I would sit slightly differently to most hippie types is I would try to respect, though, in the short term, you're still a bodybuilder. So you, it's going to take time to address that, which you probably should because it's a, it's a bit of a, a warning sign. But you still need to actually be able to train legs in lockdown in some mm. kind of meaningful way. Mm. But again, it's a bit of a highlight. If you, can't, if you can't do any single leg work to a meaningful level, yeah. again, what is... What's wrong with you? Yeah, for sure. Well, and single like, leg work hurts like a bitch. Jesus, just pistol squats in front or backward plane. They hurt like a bitch. Well, yeah. And, you know, even if you're looking at stuff like a, a, a basic split squat, so a static lunge, for want of a better term, if you, um, if you can't actually um, clean that, you're surely going to be able to clean enough 
that you could, that it would be hard to split squats. You could clean it, get into a split position and then squat it. Yeah, for sure. But worst case scenario, waste bloody bar in the corner. If you can't hold it in, in rack, waste the bar in the corner in like effectively like a landmine position. Load up one end with four plates. Pick it up and do a split squat from with a landmine. Yeah. So if you can do a split squat with a landmine, I'm not sure many people can do a four plate landmine split squat. No, uh, in, not at all. So I think there's a, a hell of a lot of options that you could be reasonably creative with, that some of which don't even require a massive amount of ability to move. Mm. They're going to be more challenging and more sensible and safer than, than turning your wheelbins upside down. Because you know, yeah. that's fine. In Like in your case, what's your body weight like? Uh, it's yeah it's 52 kilos two kilos that's what yeah it's at. so if you're 52 kilos mm. even if your squat's absolutely immense mm. the weight you're going to be squatting on a barbell is probably going to be okay on top of your wheel a bit and well no you know i'm a monster so you know it just but collapses even, my wheel a bit <laughs> just what you are. but even so it's going to support that with with you know something on top to spread the load a little bit maybe but oh yeah you're not causing that much of a problem and you know you might have at home you might have that amount of weight you know twice your body weight plus you're going to have that amount of weight at home potentially if you're looking at guys who are 200 kilo squatters who were setting up the wheelie bins at home well one if they got 200 kilos at home two is the wheelie going to be going to support 200 kilos and like you say three if they're a little bit taller getting it on and off is going to be like ridiculous oh it's a nightmare yeah you're actually making it way harder than it needs to be to actually do something that's probably not going to be that meaningful anyway because yeah. say you've only got 140 kilos of so you've got six six twenty kilo plates that's going to be more than the vast majority of people have got yeah you're, if you're a 200 kilo squatter you're you know, it's not that heavy so you're still doing pretty high reps yeah. so you still might be better off sticking three or four of those plates on one end getting it into a landmine position so it's you know in a position where you will be able to hold it in, in, in front back and do split squats. Yeah. And it's also going to give you this opportunity, this force to partners to look at, okay, well, do I actually have a deficit one leg, one side to the other, when I get to fix that? The only slight caveat to this is going back to what we were saying earlier, that is a massive change. Mm. So quite how much you throw yourself into something like that, quite how heavy you go, quite how much you attack it, you might have to be a little bit careful. Well, this is what I was actually saying because a couple of people, um, I put a story on my Instagram not so long ago, just basically saying, or it was actually last week, just saying, do you know what? I'm absolutely daffy docked. I'm going to take four days off the gym and have a deload. Um, and people were actually saying to me, I haven't had a day off the gym in six weeks and you're going to take four days off. I mean, what on earth? And I'm like, to, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm seeing more people train harder at home than I've ever seen them train in the gym because all of a sudden they just think to themselves, holy shit, the gym is shut. I now need to bury myself every day and get that kind of stimulus. And it's weird. And it's I'm just like, why are you doing it? How much time have you got? And um, other things like people that, <laughs> this is one of the things I'm finding with people that I've got is, is sort of long-term clients. I must punish myself because I've been eating crap on board. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting into some really dodgy behaviours here, aren't we? If we're bored, so we're eating crap, and then we're punishing ourselves. This is like all of this is now the best. Yeah. And training multiple times a day because you're bored. So yeah. yeah that, that, that is pretty much a recipe for hurting yourself because you're doing new movements you weren't doing before. Mm. And you're now doing like multiple times a day. Yeah. But by the same token, you know, <clears throat> understand it. And, one of the things that I've been saying to, to clients, and, you know, again, we've sort of talked about this in the past, you know, I'm not a therapist um, in, a, in a mental sense, I'm not a, a counsellor, so scope of practice, you know, you've got to respect that. But if you're coaching somebody, for, for want of a better term, everything that's happening has to be taken in context of what's going on around them. And, and, and this is like, like you know, the, the term thing banded about, like, it's, it's unprecedented, it's weird. Yeah. So you probably shouldn't be beating yourself up with that if you're not if you don't know exactly how to cope with them something that you couldn't have imagined yeah so if you're doing that by going to the fridge a lot um <laughs> beating yourself up for it isn't likely to be helpful is it so let's you know no. kind of try and give yourself a, a break but at the same time try and be constructive as to what you might do to to manage that to address that 
that again isn't all sort of just smashing yourself to bits and punishing yourself with the exercise. Totally. I know it's funny. I mean, I've, I've always used stuff like functional movements in my training anyway. So I have used things like wall walks and handstand press ups and things like that, because it's like I was saying previously, I've never been able to strict press my body weight over my head, but I can handstand push up, which is basically overloading in that particular position. Um, and it involves a lot of core stability and things like that. So when, when you're saying people are starting to introduce weird and wonderful things, well, yeah, they are. And then they, they have a look at people doing handstand press ups and then try it themselves. And then all of a sudden, you know, they fall over and give themselves a bump on the head and possibly have some amnesia going through it. But, um, it's, yeah, it is a weird situation where people are doing that. And unfortunately, if people don't have weights at home, one of the biggest things that they can use is their body weight. And you can really do yourself some muscle damage with body weight. I mean, I've seen you do some weird, wacky shit, like, you know, the inverted pistol squat and stuff like that. And I'm just like, Bleh. I mean, I can't bloody do that to save my life. But it's obviously very good to correct some imbalances, especially when you were talking about doing split squats. Um, I've got a few clients, and myself included, to be perfectly honest. Once I do a split squat, if I back load it or have it from a vertical loading point, my lower back kicks off nobody's business. So it's about sorting that, and more so on the left-hand side, but I've got a pelvic shift type thing. It's one of those where... That's dead interesting to know, isn't it? Because that 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 gives you an insight. That can be almost diagnostic, can't it? Or almost not diagnostic, as such, you know, in terms of um, like a pathology. Diagnostic yeah. in terms of um, <clears throat> what, what what's going on with you, sort of movement wise at a subclinical level. Because it, it, you're doing things you wouldn't normally do, and you yeah. kind of realise how okay, I'm actually really well adapted for all the stuff that I do. And now I suddenly find out what I had been neglecting because I get to choose my own stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's easy to rip CrossFit for how stupid it is. But actually, one, it's done so many amazing, fantastic things for the industry all around. Oh, sure. Like the ladies side, phenomenally so. And I just think what it has shown is it's shown that you don't need to be 35 stone to be strong. You don't <laughs> need to be, you know, three stone to be to have good conditioning and good endurance. And it's yeah. shown that like, actually we're quite good at being generalists as opposed to specialists. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people choosing to be specialists are actually just justifying what they don't want to do. Mm. And I think one of the problems they have is because there's so many different things that they do, it's easy to hurt yourself because you can't be conditioned and prepared for everything. Yeah. But actually over a long enough period, if you're relatively sensible about how you load it, they, they do end up really well rounded and conditioned to an awful lot of stuff. Yeah. And those of us who choose our own trading and don't get a curveball here and there, yeah, we're not. I, I, no. um, I remember going on a, a plyometrics day um, and um, I was like, well, I'm going to boss at this. Um, and it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> I spent all my time doing like explosive lifting. But this is what got me thinking about it, really, really got me thinking about it in terms of how you like potentially categorize and understand stuff. All the explosive lifting I was doing was um, basically on the spot. So the, you could argue it's a throw and a catch. Mm. Well, you're propelling an external object and then you're decelerating the external object, which means you get really good at counterbalancing stuff. Well, that is the exact opposite of moving off the spot where you're moving your body weight, where you need to get your center of mass purposely outside your base of support to, to, to you know, generate momentum. So it's like, Oh shit! Actually, when it came to me moving, I'm awful at this. Yeah, really, really bad. Because my body wants to be balanced all the time, and this mm. involved being purposely in, imbalanced, and that was dead helpful for working with like a lot of the strong strongman guys. Yeah, who the guys who are from a more athletic background will often naturally be fast at, at moving events, but some of the guys from a gym background one of the problems they'll have with moving events is exactly that. They spent so long getting dead good at squatting and deadlifting where you and the external load have to stay balanced over your feet. That when you do yoke and you and the external load have to be imbalanced over your feet, but only just enough to keep you moving, not so much that you get so far it goes down again. It's like, yeah, that's exactly how that works. So, you know, for me, that was a humbling and very valuable experience. But it also showed me like, where I got into a bit of a mentality of trying to cover off as many bases with 
as many places with as few movements as possible is actually quite limited. So yeah, you, you probably need to do some some stuff somewhere in your in your workouts that, that does have a little bit of variety. So like at the moment, something that I do myself and I get some clients doing, depending on their exact goals, it's things like, um, you would probably call them a giant set. I, I tend to call them matrix, but I suppose it's just a giant set really. But some work for time at the end of some workouts where say on leg day, they might have anywhere between say five and 10 different single leg um, body weight movements and they work through them as a sequence uh, with no rest. Yeah. So that muscular endurance work, but actually it's musculoskeletal work really. And it's just mm -hmm. meaning that nothing can fall behind that part. So they'll do some lunging sideways, they'll do some lunging with a crossover, they'll do some you know, single leg deadlifts, they'll do some single leg bridges, they'll do some squatting really narrow like a cyclist squat, they'll do some squatting really, really wide like a sumo squat, they'll do all this back to back. And actually that means you're not necessarily going to get all these ridiculous imbalances and gaps. It's going to make you more useful in life in general. But it also, exactly what we're talking about with you loading a, a split squat that way, it also has like a diagnostic effect to a degree where yeah. they'll come back and say, yeah, really, I've got a problem actually with this one of those 10 variations. And it throws something up that otherwise you might spend however long trying to assess for, which, let's face it, you, you, you haven't got all the time in the world to be doing that. Sure. I mean, professional sport show packs, like, they went through a period in some sports where they were collecting so much data, they, they never even looked at it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so much you can analyze. Mm. So, yeah, I think um, there's certainly a place for us to, to, to have a bit more variety. You've just got to be respectful of the idea that the variety is potentially something you're completely deconditioned for. So the mm. variety is its own risk. And for those of us who with the sort of gym mentality, not everything necessarily has to be massively heavily loaded or massively aggressively progressively loaded all the time it, it might be there just to be maintenance in your program so you are yeah. moving through that range of movement um i suppose that's something else i'm looking at a lot at the minute is, is putting in place for some of the movements that are a bit more out there like a standard that i want clients to hit but then actually just leave it there and just maintain that and actually not purposely don't try and progress that because you need to leave space, I suppose, in terms of overall resource and recovery. Yeah. Just up the priority. Mm. So what I'm thinking about there is like the clients have got to uh, like rehab into prehab into like SSC stuff with the runners. Um, I can think of something in particular where you know lateral stability and strength has been a huge problem. So if they had to do a lot of downhill, um, that will cause some issues because they couldn't mm. decelerate, they couldn't stabilize laterally when they were going downhill like that. So do a load of work to address that. And say you're doing something like a, like a windmill, which is obviously a lot of lateral stability. Yeah. To me, you should be able to do about half your body weight, which if you're really heavy, is obviously scary. But for these guys, some of them are getting close to it, the strength guys, because they're not that heavy. So mm. if I think of like um, quite a small lady that I work with, she's just knocking on twice body weight now. We're not going to keep pushing that up because it's going to stop having that much benefit she's not getting heavier for a running so she's not yeah. having to she's not having to decelerate more load when she's when, she, when she's running so we'll get back to that stage where you're saying well that starts to become more of a risk than it is a benefit yeah because you're pushing it for the sake of it mm. whereas actually the stuff that's then sagittal plane which will help her with producing more force in the right direction that she's running in, which is the goal then you want that to continue to improve exponentially. Yeah. You, you, you just keep on going. You, you, you know, not exponentially, infinitely, I suppose. Is the right term. You just want yeah. it to keep going. You're not wanting to, to stop that. We're not going to put a limit on that and go, oh, we don't need to be any stronger. I don't really buy that. But the stuff that's more related to decelerating your own body weight, yeah, there's a point where you're not you're actually going to need any more. 
no that's very true it is i've noticed the same actually in trying to progress um certain movements like bench presses and things like that you can only keep on trying to max out and go max threes max fours max fives every single week for a certain amount of time period until that load just gets too heavy where actually progressing on fours and fives is going to be really really difficult so you have to take a, dif a different approach to it mentally it's not always about progressively overloading so if people don't have that kind of weight available at home you need to get out of that mentality of just having progress in the form of adding more weight to the bar because there's so many different ways that you can do it yeah this is one of the other things it's it's got with this it's like wow so again you're so fixed in your mind i've not got enough weight i need more you know people find facebook saying i need more plates amount of weight this kind of thing so well try just slowing it down yeah like this is a really interesting way to find out where you're unstable because it really will show you that. But if you try to slow it down or pause it in your sticking point, or you know, mm. something that actually is going to help you big picture long term anyway, it, again, it's an opportunity. But it, it, again, we're all kind of conditioned, aren't we? And it, it's just maybe needing a little nudge in that direction saying, well, this is a chance. It's not just to make do with the best, you know, best you can. It might actually be beneficial. It might contribute in a. <laughs> I mean, like a phase potentiation sense. This is a phase where you, you do things that help foundationally that potentiate you building on that next time yep. when you go back to the gym and you can push whatever you like. Mm. So this, we don't have to view it as a we're making do. We can view it as a we're taking this opportunity to do positive, to do really good stuff. Yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> My wife and I were talking about this as well. Um, I'm not an expert on programming, um, that that's much more your area than it is, than it is mine. But one of the things that you learn being around some people who have been very, very successful is that they, they weren't massively overcomplicating things. It was all consistency and recovery. And actually, to a great extent, this sits well again with some of the research of consistency, not having massive off periods and not backing down for long. Yeah. So maybe your deloads don't need to be like massively backed off. So you've then got to massively build back up again. Maybe you only have to back up a little bit. And maybe it might be more about plateauing for a bit and actually accepting that and being consistent for a little bit. Because realistically, how much are you going to add to a lift in a year? Yeah, exactly. So if you break it down over each week, the vast majority of people are actually just trying to progress way faster than it's ever going to be realistic. Mm. But then they'll hit a sticking point. And it's awful, actually, because I get a lot of business out of this. Anyway, it's a shame coming like i need you to solve this problem i've been stuck here at this way i can't get past it i've stripped right back i've rebuilt and then i got stuck at the same way and then i've stripped right back and i've rebuilt I'm stuck at the same way like, yeah that's normal and actually you're yes, looking for some sort of magic trick but you probably just need to when you get stuck there stay there or thereabouts for a little while mm. and just persevere because you, you're expecting your body to adapt at a rate that it, it, it just isn't going to be able to no it so, can't some of it just like consistency yeah so, you know, as long as you can find some stuff that's still relatively challenging a bit of a period of consistency consistency for a lot of people might actually give them a period where they can then kick on from there mm. because they have been forced to do something a little bit different and not try and do the same sort of aggressive um constant progression that they've been trying for over long yeah absolutely so they, that's it. Um, in terms of like consistency, it's sometimes you just want to just want to carry on doing that that weight for you know three or four singles. Have any break? Do three or four singles? Have any break? Do three or four singles? You know it does it does really make sense, and it gets you neurally adapted as well as muscular adapted as well as like tendons as well. I mean tendons and muscular aspects that you've got to be careful of lifting those heavy weights all the time. Yeah, they take a pound in. A graph about this a while back. It's basically going well. If it takes your muscle six weeks to adapt um, through a full healing cycle, and this is where the, the crossover between performance stuff and clinical stuff is dead interesting because they, they, they don't mix the information well enough. It's like, okay, so a full healing cycle, if somebody's been injured for a, for a muscle, you're looking at like six weeks. For a 10, you're looking at 12 weeks. So if you, yeah. if you extrapolate that, it takes twice longer for your tendon to adapt. Mm. So actually, if you're pushing on all the time, yeah, you're bound to run into like a tendonopathy if you're just being too aggressive all the time. And then sure. that will slow you down. But I also think being um, being your size and your weight um, is in some ways a really positive thing for programming and for what it does for you in terms of your own experience of programming. Because, 
again, percentage wise, everything's different. So yes. adding two and a half kilos to the bar, the smallest plates you've got are 1.25s. Well, some of your lifts that are still very impressive lifts at your body weight, that's a huge percentage change. Oh, so it's fucking you, heavy as well. You've got to be a little bit creative with um, what you're doing then in terms of how you're increasing things over time and how you're trying to increase things. You? You've got to think a little bit more than you might do if, you, if, if, if that really is a fractional increase. Mm. I know people don't think about that when they say to me when I'm like, oh yeah, I'm putting like 0.25 of a kilo on a side because I've got micro loaders and they're like, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing. It's like, you'll be surprised how heavy half a kilo is on that bar after you've actually just maxed out on a max lift anyway. It's fucking heavy. Well, you're, so, yeah. you're, you are pushing the boundaries, aren't you? You're at that sharp end because you're saying records. So by definition, it, it, it's fractional gains, it's marginal gains. And mm. I, I'm, one of the things I encourage a lot of sort of probably most intermediate lifters really because beginners progress fast anyway, don't they? Yeah. But certainly I think I fall into this bracket and a lot of people will probably never progressing past intermediate because you're always getting patient and change something too dramatically mm. and do something else or drop a lift completely or strip it back and rebuild it in some way rather than actually just be patient. And you probably get to be in advance literally by being more and more patient. Exactly. And more, with, with with the same and one of the guys that I can think of at the gym that everyone goes I can't believe he's not in himself I can't believe he's not in himself training like that and it's like well it might seem crazy but he's lifting like that every week Yeah. so although if there is a problem it'll be a major problem because it is heavy heavy actually it's probably in some ways helping that it is like that every week mm. Whereas the guys who are like, oh, I'm being dead sensible, you know, I have like an off period and then I build back up. It's, mm, that might actually, like tissues wise, be a problem. Yeah, for sure. I agree. It's all about thinking about things properly. And um, I think I think that's a really nice note to leave it on as well. You've, you've got to think about things in a really it's a more savvy way than we are doing at the moment. You know, think outside the box rather than in your little box in lockdown. You know, you, we have to think about different things and be creative and just be safe because let's face it, the NHS are overrun with um, COVID-19 anyway. They certainly don't want to be overrun by idiots who have fallen over with wheelie bins and, and shit like that, just trying to squat. You know, there's so many other things you can do. So Chris, um, thank you so much for your time. I know that you're a massively busy person. Um, do you want to leave on any kind of words of wisdom? No, mate, just thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, I really do. Oh, that was nice. That's a good word of wisdom, saying thank you to the Titan. <laughs> anyway right okay guys i will put um all of chris's details in so if you do have any issues that you wish to approach him about um he's also known as the move well project on instagram so go and check him out from there i'll put on all of the links as always underneath the youtube channel um and yeah thank you again once for checking in and we shall catch up with you next time bye bye, bye.